Mutual inverses, what do I mean by this? When you have a function and you compare it to its inverse, right? One of the examples we had a look at before was things like, say, um, that I think might have been the first fx we looked at, and we found that its inverse was, what was it, a third x plus 1, I think it was, right? Yeah? So what you're doing here, like what are the instructions here? Take a number, an input, multiply it by 3, and then take away 1. And this does everything but opposite. It's like, well, add 1 and then divide by 3, right? So inverse functions, they're kind of like, um, they're, the, they're the control Z of the function world, okay? It's just like, whatever you did, I'm going to undo it, okay? And so because this undoes whatever it is that this does, something unusual happens when you put one function into the other. We call this composing, when you compose one function with another. And we'll take this as an example. Okay, so underneath where you've got this, just write down with me, right? As an example, if you take f of x, but instead of putting in x or a number like 3 or 8 or something like that, if what you put into f of x is its inverse, right? So that's why I've got these big square brackets so I can distinguish between them, okay? Something weird happens. Watch this. I'm going to write f of x which is this, but everywhere I see x, I'm going to replace it with the inverse function, okay? which, is, which is this guy. right? So watch what happens. Here is the inverse function right there. So you can see the inverse function, f of inverse, f inverse of x, has been, has, is replacing this x here. Right? 3 times that, take away 1. Okay? Now watch what happens as you start to like, just unpack this algebraically. Right? What happens to that 3 and that 1 third? Yeah, they just cancel each other out, so you just end up with x plus 1, and then there's this takeaway 1 hanging out on the end, right? What does that become? X. X. Huh. And this was what happens if you put the inverse inside the original function. What happens if you did it in the other direction? If you took the inverse function, and what you put in was not x or a number, what if you put in the entire original function? f of x. Okay, well, let's give it a go. Here is the outside, the inverse function, right? A third of something plus one. But the something that I'm going to put in is the original function. Original function? Which is there, right? 3x minus one. Like so. Right? So you can see there is the original function sitting inside. And just like before, if I just start to simplify on autopilot what I normally do, what happens inside the brackets? You just get the, the minus one and the plus one just cancel each other out. So you get 3x in here, and then you're like, wait a second, that's just x again. x again. Now, think about what this is, right? You start with something, right? You do something, and then you undo it. Unsurprisingly, you end exactly where you started. Does that make sense? Um, you do, you undo, or you undo, then you do. You're always going to come back where you began, which is why we call them mutual inverses. They kind of both undo each other, which is what mutual means. Okay. So, so for this next bit, if you've got everything underneath this mutual inverses business written down, um, we'll leave space for this subheading because I don't want to spoil it just yet. But you might have noticed when we did our very first examples um, of how to go from an, a, a function to its inverse, um, I gave you this linear function, and then I went straight to a cubic. Did you notice that? And you're like, cubics are hard. Why do that? Why not go to something simpler, like, say, a quadratic? Well, it turns out in this particular context, I'm going to show you why, the quadratic is not simpler. Let's think about this, right? Here's y equals x squared. Let's call this our original function, right? What would I do to this to get the inverse of this? Yeah, I'm just going to swap these, right? So I'm just going to write down inverse. You can write this with me, right? This is the original. You'll write down, well, I'll just swap these guys around. I get this, right? Now, this is a function, right? In fact, I'll just do a, and you might like to do this as well. I'm just going to do a little quick sketch here. This is what, that's black, isn't it? This is what y equals x squared looks like, okay? But this guy here, hmm. Let's, um, let's make y the subject, shall we? Can we make y the subject? Because that's what we normally do. To, it makes it easier to read. So um, I'll just write the y on the left hand side. What should I do to both sides? Y is equal to the square root of x. I should take square root, right? So that gives me just the y on the left hand side. I'll get the square root of x. But you guys remember, when you've got this kind of equation, you don't just get one value at the end, do you? You get two. You get plus or minus. Very good. Now, this guy here, this is a bit problematic. Because if you do a little sketch with me now, if you remember, 
what happens when you take a, a graph and you get its inverse, right? You're doing a, do you remember what we, this is algebra. What's it going to do visually, yeah, right? On it, it reflects across, I'm running out of colors, right? It reflects across this y equals x line. Remember that, right? So what's going to happen is you get this shape. I'm deliberately not putting on the same one because they get a bit busy, right? So can you see if you sort of flip it around that way, you'll get this shape. Now this is not a function. What is it? Relation. It's a relation because if I get my good old vertical line out, you're like, whoop. Totally fail, right? So like, this is not an inverse function. So what am I saying here? When you take a function and you look at its inverse, you may not get a function. You may get a relation. In fact, we should write that down, right? This is a, um, this is a relation, OK? So in other words, and this is um, probably worth writing down actually word for word, not all functions have an inverse function. As you can see here, and this is the reason why I didn't include it in our original our introductory examples, um, when you try and take the inverse of this, you don't get an inverse function, you get an inverse relation. And can you imagine if you went to your calculator, right? And every time you went, like, take the square root of something, and it gave you two numbers, you'd be like, well, which one is it, right? You want one answer. Your calculator is built for functions. Get a number in, give you a number out, OK? So this is kind of a problem for us, right? But we can solve this problem, and we're going to use a technique that we learned all the way back when we started out with functions, which was, if you don't take all of the original function, just look up for a second, look up for a second. If instead of taking this whole thing, you only take a section of it, it's going to be okay, right? If, for example, I just take that part there, right? So if I, if, I, if I sort of define it piecewise, if I restricted the domain and said, I just want x is greater than 0, right? What happens when you do the reflection? You know that visual thing, right? Which part are you going to get? Have a look. You're going to get the You're going to get the top half. Can you see it? Um, this one I am willing to put, whoopsie daisy, I am going to put on the same one because look, can you see the, can you see the symmetry? You like turn your head and you're like, oh, there it is, right? So in other words, we can turn a function into an inverse function if we're willing to only take part of it, right? So we say, uh, you, can, um, you can put a name on this subheading now, right? Restricting the domain. If you restrict the domain of a function, if you do it intelligently, you can make sure you get an inverse function out the other side. And knowing how to restrict the domain is one of the things you need to um, learn about, right?